So this is kind of like the reverse of auto tune in, you know, Waves Real Tune, where you can put this in on a track or on a, you know, on a, um, a channel and it will detect the key for you. Yeah, but I think this would be a great tool if you're trying to take, let's just say sermon content and quickly repurpose it for your social media at your church. You're pulling the video from your live stream file. Uh, you probably already have it on YouTube actually. And then you can go through and, you know, put it in here. Yeah, you think your LED project costs a lot. What is this? It's $2 billion to build this piece of equipment here. Like, hey, we will do anything short of sin <laughs> to reach those for Christ, Luke. Worshipleaderresearch.com. If you guys haven't heard about it, I highly recommend checking it out. We'll link it down below. They are putting out these really great and informative reports on surveys that they've been working on uh, for worship leaders. This one that they just released here in July of 23 is a survey on how do worship leaders feel about the industry surrounding the songs they sing. Mm. I'll tell you how I feel. I feel like we live in a worship music industrial complex that wants to put out a lot of music for people to play and people can make a lot of revenue off of licensing said music, charts, tracks, and such. And I would propose, this is my hypothesis, my hypothesis is that the incentives of the worship music industry industrial complex don't always align with the incentives of what's best for a local church congregation and their worship diet and liturgy. Mm. That's how I feel. It's good. <laughs> mm. so Agree? The, disagree? I don't know. What do you guys think? We can dive into some of I think it's the like... I wouldn't want to go down the road of saying it's as, as bad as like the dairy industry or like the pharmaceutical yeah. industry, but I mean, maybe it's on that path, you know? It's not like actively destructive. It's not like there are songs that are opposite of what's good mm -hmm. for the church, but um, yeah, a little bit of misaligned probably incentives there. I, I will say at the top, we live in an exciting time where there are amazing songwriters out there. And with technology, we have access to like learning about new songs very quickly. I'm grateful for that. I think it's way more enjoyable being a worship leader uh, now in 2023 than it was in 1993. Lot, lots more options out there, great songs to choose from. My my warning to especially younger worship leaders is don't feel like you have to do every stinking new song that comes out just because, you know, somebody shared it on their Instagram account or you found it on YouTube. Um, that's not always, I think, the, the wisest thing in how you build your song library. So question number one, and again, I'll link this down below. Go check it out. You can subscribe. I got an email from them when they came out with this. So I like was able to know right when it was like hot off the press. I have no like affiliation with these guys. Um, one of the guys is going to come speak at Church Front Live. Uh, um, Elias uh, Dummer is going to be there in October. So check that out. But anyways, um, how do you feel about the number of new songs promoted for congregational use? 44% want less. 27% want more. Hmm. And this is worship leaders weighing in on this this survey? Yeah. Wow. Um, right here, you can see the denominational breakdown. Wow. Of pretty good spread. Lots of Baptist, lots of non-denom, lots of Wesleyan. Yeah. Huh. Um, only, so only 412 worship leaders. I kind of think Church Front should partner with these guys to be like, hey, let's get more data. Because <laughs> yeah. it's like, it's not a huge data pool. That, that'd be my one critique of this. It's like, how could you get that to like 4,000 or something like that? And yeah. see, maybe probably see similar trends. Um, what do you guys feel like? Would you be want less or want more? I my, I think the singles, the singles schedule is off the charts. I mean, it, there's a new, I feel like you're seeing a new single released every, every two weeks from different artists and, um, I think that that can just create a culture of laziness. It doesn't always, but a culture of laziness in uh, the worship leader's approach to being a true theological dietitian. You know, Zach Hicks always talks about forming your worship services around that theological diet. And I think with the pace at which new material is coming out, it's like this shiny new gear syndrome that worship leaders have. They just feel like they almost have to go do that instead of kind of, you know, reflecting on what actually that 
uh, meal might look like for for your service, what that set list might look like for your service. Because oftentimes, I think it's it can be good to reach back, you know, reach back in history rather than reaching forward to the new the new toy on the block or whatnot. So I don't know. I I would probably land in the want less category just because I think a lot of it can be um, I'll just say fluffy. You know, it's it's like a single for single sake to to get on the release charts, but that's probably my own opinion. Yeah, it's a lot to wade through, but I think on the bigger scale, bigger picture, this is just the trend of the, you know, information overload age that we live in. So it's more to wade through, which is can be frustrating, but also I think you got to hone your skill of limiting your inputs as well. So being able to really discern like, okay, is this a song that I'm going to even listen to or look at or consider or uh, do I need new songs right now? And just having a better handle on understanding what your congregation needs and, you know, what's your canon at the moment. Yeah, it's good. Question two, when considering a song for congregational use, how important is the song's association with an artist or church that your decision on whether to use it? So 44% unimportant, uh, 40% important. I think that feels about right. And this is getting to the, oh, you know, Bethel or Elevation, they have some theologically questionable teachings, like, should we do those songs? Um, yeah, this yeah is I think it's sticky. Yeah, the, yeah, again, because to me, I I really, I tend to take, t- take things on a song by song basis. Um, so that's why I guess I'd be on the, the 44% unimportant side of things. Yeah. Yeah, I would yeah. probably land on the unimportant side with with the caveat that I think you always um, you're going to get questions about it all the time. You know, when I, we we coach people who are like, I don't want to put the CCLI, you know, uh, information up on the song, you know, the slide for pro presenter because I don't want them to see that it's a Bethel song or a Hillsong song with all the controversy or whatever. It's just like I think you got to it opens the door for some pastoral conversations around how you plan the sets. And sometimes that can be a really good opportunity to just lead, you know, lead a little bit more with your congregation there. So, but I'd probably land on the unimportant side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's different fears. There's the fear of, you know, man, fear of people being upset with you because they see the name Bethel here at Hillsong. I think there's the, the fear of giving money to those ministries. Um, But then uh, I think that, God uses people that are imperfect to, you know, promote his message. So I don't think that that for me, if the song's theological content is done well, if it teaches what I'm hoping it does, then I'm not as concerned about it. All right. Now, now we actually start to throw down some names. Ooh. So who, how likely uh, would you say you are to select a song for congregational use that is associated with Bethel? would be the most unlikely. Phil Whitcomb would be the most likely. But what happens when the people who, who yeah. choose Bethel realize that Honestly, they're, kind of, they're big, kind of all part of the same team? Yep. yep. Honestly, um, like the the Phil Wickham and Brian Johnson co-writes are the biggest bangers. Those are such yeah. good songs. Like yeah. Sorry theologically, like I love the anymore. lyrics. Yeah. Yeah. What's an example of that? Which one? Uh, living mistaken, home, yeah. Living hope is a cool right. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so it's funny. It's like even there's a difference between awareness of people who just like don't look at the actual artist names and realize like, okay, yeah, like Brian Johnson co-writes with people. Um, I agree, awesome stuff. Um, and yeah, it's it's kind of it's all so everybody is interrelated and very I think very collaborative, which I think is a positive thing. You have different branches of the church. I guess it's largely, largely though, very um, kind of Pentecostal, charismatic, dominant though, when you look at all mm-hmm. these artists and churches in front of us, right? I would say yeah. except for maybe Phil Wickham and Vertical. Yeah. It's interesting though, because like Vertical, you know, they're part of Harvest and they went through their whole, you know, church controversy. And so, I mean, it's just like, you know, what at what point do you just stop at what point do you have to give up your cancel culture attitude towards some of this stuff because of, you know, fallen, fallen people in the fallen world. But, um, yeah. I'm surprised people like, you know, I would be interested to see, uh, 
what they would do if like Shane and Shane were on here, you know, somebody from, or like, you know, at list, maybe a less mega church, you know, writer or something like that and see what, see what the results would be on that side of things. And it's hard because people like even Matt Redman, you know, Matt Redman, we sing 10,000 reasons for like 20 or so years. I felt like we sang that song all the time. And he, you know, he collaborates with people at Mariners and he collaborates with people. You know, I just, it feels like, man, they're Bethel. Yeah. yeah, You're, you're sending voice memos to people, you know, for collaborative Mm -hmm. efforts to songwrite. So at some level you gotta just, man, take off your, loosen your belt a little bit. I feel like when it comes to that, because we don't see all the intricacies of the songwriting process. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm really yeah curious about Hillsong and kind of the future where they're heading. And, um, did you guys see the, the Hulu Hillsong documentary? Haven't watched or it yet. FX one. No. It's a, it's interesting. It's, it's a documentary. So I think a, a documentary can convince you that the, the sky is purple, uh, if it wants to, and you'll, you'll feel very convicted that it is. So very, very well done from a filmmaking documentary standpoint. Mm. Um, but pretty, pretty clear agendas behind it. Um, visual, it's it, me personally, if Hillsong keeps creating great songs, that's going to serve our local congregation that are theologically sound. I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing them. Doesn't, doesn't influence my personal selection of them. Um, Let's see here. But at the same time, Hillsong's got a lot of junk they got to figure out. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Visualizing the trend. Okay. That's just another chart. Lots of cool charts. I would, I would be interesting, interested in seeing a chart that has some of these things, but also broken down into denominations, which I think would mm-hmm. require a capture of like, you know, 400 people from this denomination, 400 people from this denomination or expression of worship so that you could see you know, a little bit more specific information. Cause yeah, my thought is that there's a bunch of Pentecostal churches that are like, we're going to do every new elevation song that comes out a week after it comes out. And there's going to be a bunch of like, you know, SBC churches that are like, we're only doing Shane and Shane. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mm -hmm. there's, you can spread it out, but I think that that's a little bit what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Do you wish your church was more similar in worship culture style to the churches and artists previously mentioned? 54% say yes. Um, Hmm. And my guess is when they're saying yes, they're, they're talking about, yeah, the worship culture of very, most of these artists being, you know, again, charismatic, Pentecostal, very expressive worship, high, like high emotion worship. Again, stuff that can be positive, but you want to also, balance that with other expressions of worship, um, which again, I think it's helpful to look back at the history of liturgy and what other churches do can be, can be helpful there. Hmm. Yeah. I think Um, that we have churches in our circle, like students and, you know, other churches that we've done videos with that have more liturgical, but still expressive worship. And I know that Zach Hicks recommended a book to me and he's, trying to go down this path with the church that he's leading of, of having both in a good balance. So yeah. I think that that's something more that we should aim for instead of just trying to copy what some mega church is doing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Interesting question about our songs promoted for congregational use, um, primarily written in response to events in the lighter's right life versus contractual obligations. So that's, Whoa. that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, again, this is, I don't know. Again, this is all about how we feel, worship leaders feel about it. Yeah. Um, it's hard to, that's hard to say though. You don't really know where an artist is at. And art, some artists are just like, yeah, you know what? They're like, it's like an artist being like, Hey, I don't feel like paying this picture, but like someone's paying, paying me to paint. They commissioned me to pay this picture and I'm good at it. So I'm going to do my thing and make my, right. you know, make my income as a, as my, for my living. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's, mm-hmm. that's great. People are gifted that way. Um, how likely are you to consider a new song for congregational use when you first encountered it through different sources? So I'm not going to go through all of these. Mm. Very interesting. So this is a really good question. Seems like the highest social media peers is the very likely. So we always go by our friends recommendations uh, streaming. Oh, sorry. 
live events. I was looking at the wrong. Oh, um, interesting. Church church oh, yeah. leaders recommend. I was a little confused for which one was the title for what. So it looks like church leader recommendations, live events recommendations. Yeah, that's cool. Because, yeah, it's, it's like your boss tells you to do it. You're going to do it. <laughs> and then and if then, a, uh, a live event, it's like you experience that song. You're more excited about it. Yep. And then streaming's up there. I mean, it's higher than I would have thought. But, I mean, the playlist curation for, you know, mm. worship music, that's – that's not, I yep. mean, that's a little bit surprising to me, but that's, that's kind of interesting to see that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm curious if you guys have any personal experience of the last time that you, you heard a song and you're like, oh, I have to lead this for my church. Uh, recently it was one of the songs. I think it was like, uh, actually Holy Forever. Uh, I think that's the, that's example of one of the banger videos. <clears throat> that was, it was a Tomlin and, and Johnson and, I don't know who else was on that, but great song. Maybe, maybe Whitcomb mm. on it as well. But that was a song where it's like, yeah, just, I think that's going to be the, the the 2023 song, in my opinion, mm-hmm. of best best song that was written. Cool. So, guys, go to the link below. Um, you can see the team. Yeah, this is the team who's um, behind all this. Um, uh, Baker, Shannon, Elias Dummer, Mark. Joe Jolke sounds like a French last name. Adam Perez, Mike Tapper, um, go, go, just subscribe. Again, I don't even yeah. know what's behind this. You know who's who's funding this? Maybe the Worship Music Industrial Complex is funding this site actually, and they just want <laughs> they just want more of your data. Elias Dummer writes songs, right? Yep, he does. He does. Uh, or anyways, and like again, like I said, uh, shout out to Church Front Live. Go to Church Front Live this year. Elias is going to be there. He's going to be on our podcast soon. I started to put the schedule together, and I I gave I, what I like to do when I make the schedule. I just put keynote speakers' titles in there for them, so that they just like have to do what I want them to talk on. So you could see how the worship music industrial complex works with Elias Dummer. <laughs> Love it. So <laughs> I don't know if that's actually what he's going to talk about, but you know, it kind of gives you a flavor for why or an idea of why people are coming. Um, so that's going to be fun. So go here, October 17th or 18th here in Littleton. It's going to be a fun time. It is the highlight of the church front community year. Moving on. All right. So more of a technical thing. Um, I was looking for a low cost solution to help people do virtual sound check. Uh, quick explanation, virtual sound check, being able to record every single input from your mixing console to a digital audio workstation and then being able to play it back to your mixing console so that audio engineers can be practicing mixing. I think that this is uh, an amazing tool. It's like one of the best ways that you can grow as an audio engineer. It's also a really helpful tool for your uh, rehearsals and being able to mix your in-ear monitors. So I wanted as many people as possible to start doing it. And this is a zero cost intro to it. You need a computer for it to run on, obviously, but I've been playing around with this and um, it records all of your inputs and outputs. It even does mixing. I haven't played around with actually um, putting some EQ and compression and doing the mix within it, but they even have a house of worship template, you know, that you can it, see it's got sermon, organ, choir keys. So it's wow. pretty cool. I haven't seen a lot of free DAWs that even have those capabilities. Uh, Tracks Live from Waves was a great one. They stopped supporting it. Recommended Reaper. Reaper is $60, but it's very complicated. Um, the UI, the UX, I'd argue, is not amazing. I love Ableton. It's $400, $500. So uh, definitely check this out. Uh, it could be a great solution for you as you're learning how to do virtual sound check. Um, we teach this in a lot of our YouTube videos and courses and uh, just think it's a really important way to grow as an audio engineer. Okay, so... Cross-platform, Mac and PC? Yep, probably Linux too. Yeah. So there is a Waveform Pro, and what is the difference if you get the Pro level? Yeah, so if you look at um, the compared features here, uh, you don't get the instrument pack. Don't need that for even, you know, let's say that you even want to use this to mix your live stream. You don't need the sampler effects. 
You don't need a drum sampler. Um, what else does it not come with? I'm not sure what Pro MIDI means, but probably don't need it for broadcast mixing or chord companion or removing yeah. silence or groove doctor. Like none of these things will hold you back from being able to multi-track record and playback or probably even mix your live stream. Yeah. I would start with maybe just doing the multi-track recording uh, in, in uh, virtual sound check. Make sure it's stable. Make sure it works before you you know start mixing live right. with it too often. Um, yeah, but that's great. I mean, that's a great solution. It's cool how they're doing the freemium model there, where they're like, "Hey, just have the main main DAW for free," and then of course you can upgrade. That's how that's how they make money because we know nothing's free, right? In right. life, it's yep. a uh, it's a lead generator. Create a user who yep. then. Probably but even is gonna waveform upgrade. pro is a hundred dollars. So it's not yeah. like unheard of for a fully functional DAW. Yep. 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 So I'd be interested. Let us know in the comments. Have you come across this? Have you used it? We'd love to know. Do you find yeah. the UI is like simpler than Ab Ableton? Um I've I've made or... a template that is like you can hide things. So I've hidden everything that's unnecessary and it makes it um even cleaner than Ableton. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's cool. Nice. So nice. it's pretty neat. My guess, yeah, my guess would be hard for it to be an Ableton replacement with Ableton's ability to play back things and jump around timelines and stuff like that. But who knows? It'll be interesting to see how people use it. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, also out. in the multi-tracks. What's that? I said good find. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to start implementing this in some of our on-site students um, as I go there and, and help them program things. They're able to save some money, so that'll be cool. Yep. Um, also, in the the DAW or multi-tracks world, we've got playback from multitracks.com uh, just released their um, automation feature. So you're able to automate volumes and um, I'm assuming mutes as well. They've already had a lot of these features in place, but they just keep adding things that make it a, a better and better solution. I know that we've used it at South Fellowship. Um, I'm not sure if Luke, your church uses it or not, but we have a lot of people that, that use it and it does everything that they need it to. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and to help people not, not confuse this feature, they've already been doing like the MIDI out for automating lyrics and lights, not to be confused yes. with like, this is your automating volumes and mutes for audio tracks with playback. In the same way that what's what's benefit of something like Ableton is you can, you know, cut, you can cut out different sections of clips or you could do volume automations and DAW, but they basically, and they put this feature in here. So now if I'm like, okay, I want this backing track to be here in the, in the, present within this like chorus but i don't want it in, in the bridge now you can do that whereas before you you pretty much couldn't do that without manually like moving the fader down during the song right it was either That's an cool. on off it was always an on off kind of approach of like oh yeah. i don't like that bgv so i'm gonna turn it off in the track but now you can program it to like come in on the last chorus or something like that yep that's pretty yeah, dope. very impressive before we continue on with the video, I want to tell you about our sponsor, the Church Front Live Conference. It's a two-day conference with keynotes and breakout sessions on topics like worship tech, worship theology, musicianship, and leadership. It is a great way to network with other like-minded ministry leaders in the Church Front community. The sooner you purchase your Church Front Live tickets, the greater the discount you will get with the Early Bird discount code. So head on over to churchfrontlive.com, use that Early Bird discount code at checkout, and I look forward to seeing you at the conference. Now let's get back to the video. Uh, hey, I want to I want to chat through this uh, new AI plugin from Waves. Um, it's not it might be a month old at this point, but yeah, I'd be curious to know if you guys see any uh, worship context applications to this key detector. So this is kind of like the reverse of Auto Tune in you know Waves Real Tune, where you can. Put this in on a track or on a you know on a um, a channel and it will detect the key for you and so i get ads for wave stuff all the time and i thought oh this is interesting i might uh bring this up during the show so any kind of you know worship context you think would be a, a good avenue for this plugin in your your processing chain yeah i would 
I would say that I've already seen people use it. I've seen people post on Facebook groups of them throwing this on like a lead vocal. Um, and then you can have your, your snapshots or your channels off for the waves tune plugins. And then as soon as you capture what key it is, transmit key, send it out to all the waves plugins that you have. So this would be a really awesome situation. Like I know, um, uh, James, who has been at our church front live event as well. He's worked at like IHOP or different churches where it's like they just go 24 seven or they have prayer rooms that are going for a long mm-hmm. time. And as an audio engineer, you don't get a PCO sheet with like, okay, this song's in C major. This song is in B flat. Like they're just playing. So unless you, I've done this, I pull up a little piano on my phone and I hit the buttons and I'm like, okay, now I know what key this is. But that's not a great way to do it. Um, this is much better. So I think that we're going to see this. I'm I'm probably going to try this myself uh, the next time that that I mix, throw this into Super Rack, and uh, see how well it does. That is cool. How it transmits the keys to the other uh, Waves plugins. Like man, that that is that is slick. Because at first I'm like, I didn't think about using it in a more of a real time environment like that. Um, so maybe now I'd be like, okay you could put it in wave super rack. Um, maybe you just have a snapshot that's saved to like, uh, enable or disable all vocal, all vocal tuning plugins, just waves tune real time. Right. So you could be like, okay, d- during a song transition, I really don't know. And I, I want to give key detector time to know what key this is. So let's just disable those plugins right now with one click, let key detector do its thing, lock into a key and then enable it, you know, when it's ready. I guess that's how I would think about how I'd use yeah. it. But I don't know if there's a different way you do it, Adam. No, I mean, I have a stream deck that I take with me that's loaded up with all the keys. So I just hit it and it sends a MIDI note and it pulls up the right uh, snapshot. Um, but if you can hit the transmit key button with a MIDI button somehow, then you could just use the stream deck to like hit, okay, um, detect key, and then it probably is detecting the key all the time because I'm not seeing any other buttons. So mm. you probably mm. just need one button that hits transmit key, and you yeah. don't even necessarily need the other snapshots. That's cool. So cool. Wow. AI in audio engineering. Love it. Um, I I want to bring up um, another AI thing I think that we've been using at Churchfront that would be handy for – uh, church is trying to repurpose content that they capture on Sunday mornings. Um, it's this website, Opus Opus Clip. Um, so you can, what's cool about it, so if you go to, I guess, opus.pro is the, the URL, and you put a YouTube video link in, like what I did, and then I go down here to, after it's, it's basically automatically creates captions. It also, it automatically finds the clips in your podcast interview or whatever, that's going to be a banger. And it also works well for what, what would be sermons at churches. Yep. So like, if you go to like, a, I used it for church front live because it's, it's kind of like sermons at a church and it did a really good job uh, because we film, you know, in 16 by nine, I made the template so that the video is 16 by nine. And then it kind of blurs out. Um, it kind of makes that blurry background look, but it looks great because we could put our, our uh, text up here and in the caption generator down here. So you could see it generated like a dozen, <laughs> a four, 14 clips from this one keynote. And it put the caption. Now, I would say probably two of these are actually useful. It's not like they are all 14 amazing clips, but it still saves even just to make one of these things like it still saves time to put it in there. It does cost money. You like add credits to, to have more time and stuff like that. But I think this would be a great tool if you're trying to take sermon, let's just say sermon content and quickly repurpose it for your social media at your church. You're pulling the video from your live stream file. Uh, you probably already have it on YouTube actually. And then you can go through and, you know, put it in here. I would recommend making sure though, like if you put your, your YouTube live stream link in here, you can tell Opus Clip to only pull from like the sermon section of the video, don't pull it from like the music because that's not gonna that's not gonna turn out well. Um, but this stuff is it's getting better quickly. 
And this whole AI trend stuff, like it, it, a lot of it kind of feels hokey and like it's trendy, but there are some genuinely useful tools that are coming out that I'm like, oh, that is awesome. Yep. And this is like stupid, easy to use too. You don't have to be a, I mean, it saves you from importing it in a vertical mode into a, in a video editor, saves you from having to use YouTube's editor. Like you just paste the link. It, you know, it takes like maybe 10, 15 minutes to spit out your, the vertical clips and it's already all, you know, <laughs> formatted, transcribed, you know, the the captions, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it really does, it's a time saver for those who are trying to kind of stay up on their socials. Um, and you can still be selective. So you're not limited to the, um, to the, the, the clips that it gives you, you could download that clip and then you could import it into iMovie or Final Cut or Adobe and, and edit it more. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just super, I mean, I feel like a, a caveman could do it. Yep. And it looks like, I think they added a feature that even gives me better control over, oh yeah. So now this, like they're updating this every week. Before I couldn't do this a week ago, but now I can click on a word and be like, I want that to be the end of the video. Instead yep. of like just randomly, you know, it's just kind of picking whatever it wants. So now it gives us a little bit more to play with there too. Um, and then for the brand settings, I can go in here. Sorry, you just let me move myself over here for, so you guys can see. Sorry. So the, what I'll show you down here is I can I can edit on the caption side. I can make corrections to the text, um, whatever it highlights, you know, misspelling and stuff like that. And then on the brand control, I can be like, I want it to be a two line caption. You can see it change over here. I want it to be a different font. I want to have a different overlay. So I put these overlays on here um, where I can go through. I made a couple different templates uh, for Opus Clip, and then I could put like a Churchman Live overlay. So I, again, if you're a production director trying to help your creative team, like this could be a really cool tool, tool to, to start doing. It'd be funny if you just start doing it and like you didn't tell like how you didn't tell anybody how, what tool you're using, and you're like, you could. <laughs> I wonder how many people are like starting business models where it's like, hey, I make short form uh, clips from whatever. Yeah, and they literally just do this. <laughs> yep. Well, and now you don't it's even like, need like video editing skills because you can do like the nonlinear, you know, descript and the text based editing. There's all these oh, AI wow. tools that will spit out the transcript and you basically cut out like a Word document style to remove the ums and the ands and the different sections where you might have stumbled and and then it, you know, spits you out a video file with all those edits in it and you don't even have to download Adobe or Final Cut, like you just do it all within a text-based editor. It's going to be pretty gnarly yep. for those looking to get in the creative space. Yep. You could buy like a Chromebook and you right. could just like start a whole new business. Yep. Yep. Uh, the Speaking of AI, they're on this uh, new Sony release. Who's got the Sony page there? I got that. Yep. So there's this new Sony A6700. Uh, apparently, has some AI like face detecting teach features and um, things of that nature. It's not out yet, but the drop was was announced. So I thought we'd talk about it here on the show. Yeah, because we yeah, recommended AI the, recognition. The A6400. Um, it's a really great entry level camera, but it's starting to do some great stuff. Like all around, could be a great photo, video camera, streaming camera. Um, just very capable for being a APS-C sized camera. Sony's making mm -hmm. some great stuff. And um, we've, this is probably our, in our beginner live stream setup. If you just want one quality camera, you're not going to be moving it or reframing it a lot. Uh, you know, a couple A6700s could be, could be a cool, cool option to do. It's definitely pricier than the A6400. I mean, I think it's over a thousand, but it's still for an APS-C size sensor. It's a I agree. It'd be a great like starting place for a lot of churches. It would get you probably just like that next step up from the A64s. Um, mm -hmm. But lots of ports, you know, le interchangeable lenses, the whole the whole gamut. So, um, I wanted to make no. I think on a previous episode of Churchfront Live, I mentioned how or Churchfront Show you could check out a site called House of Worship AVL for sale. And this is what this link looks like right now on my page. Um, so I just saw, it looked like there's some nightmare stories where people like buy stuff and the shipping's a nightmare. So buyer beware. Like I think I pointed out, but I also want to say, I think I mentioned it last time. Beware of Facebook groups like that. Don't, 
you know, that's why it's it's better to buy from trusted sources, whether it's a trusted retailer. Uh, for used gear, we do trust churchgear.com. Um, you just be, got to be careful or even buying. The thing is when you buy through an eBay or a Reverb, there's better accountability systems in play where sellers can't like mess with you. So right. just please be aware when you're buying stuff um, from those Facebook groups. Yep. Guys, we got to talk about, uh, this is one I submitted to our our Slack channel, but as uh, I think this might be the last one, but I wanted to show you guys this freaking incredible LED wall project in Vegas. Have you guys seen pictures of this yet? The sphere. Yes. Oh my gosh. I, it's only a matter of time we see Transformation Church. Man, that's going to be like a, that's a bab. I'm going to submit that Babylon B article idea of like Transformation Church, you know, acquires the LED strip sphere or something like that. And you know. Yeah, you think your LED project costs a lot. What is this? It's $2 billion to build this piece of equipment here. Like, Hey, we will do anything short of sin to reach those for Christ, Luke. Come on. <laughs> But people have been, I, I don't know if it's memes or if it's, uh, you know, Photoshop online, but people have been putting hilarious things on this sphere. They put the Windows update screen on it. And so it just was yep. like that, you know, automatic update. Sorry, this site can't be reached kind of thing. Um that's you know, funny. and so people have been doing uh, a lot of. They put an eyeball on it the first day. Yes, this is the perfect, the perfect image. So this might be a real thing. I can't really tell, but I thought this was hilarious. It's got to be a meme. So I think someone must have had to be a meme. Had to have photoshopped it. Yeah. Um, but the cool, the cool thing I think about this, not that it's like anything that a church would do at a grand scale or anything like that, but if you don't know, this is a concert venue in Vegas, so you can go into this sphere of LEDs. And then I hear that the inside is also pretty, pretty much LED. So it, you have kind of a, a wild experience there as a concert venue, but I had never seen anything besides just like a 2d LED panel, you know, as a design wow. element for a church. So I wonder as technology advances, if you will be able to see different shapes and configurations of LED you know, uh, layouts for stage design for, you know, um, you know, maybe you do a, a work or whatever. It's gonna be cool. Mike, Mike Todd is going to have like a, you know, 40 foot tall led like button humanoid shape or something like that. And, and, uh, that's, you know, HDR video. It's going to look great. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> the whole I'm getting, uh, mind. It's like, what is wait this? A second. Uh, like, who else made huge statues of himself <laughs> in the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> oh man, right. that eye is freaky. That's going to be like the only place in the world, Las Vegas, where the zoning and city allows for a giant humongous globe at nighttime like that. It's That's right. Like, <laughs> the light pollution, imagine being next door to that. That would be horrible. Yep. Yep. Oh man. Well, that was, I thought that was unique and wanted to, wanted to bring it uh, to our audience for a, a good laugh and also just to be in amazement of how much people spend on LED. Yep. Yeah. RIP Great. property value of people that live right here. Right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you get eyeball front views. It's like, <laughs> the, uh, man. Well, cool, guys. Uh I want to encourage everybody listening, check out worshipministryschool.com. As always, that's where we're helping coaching people going out to churches. You guys got a couple trips lined up in the next couple months. Um, fun stuff we're working on. Um, it's been fun piecing together um, different systems for clients and, and helping them uh, actually acquire that gear and get it shipped out. Um, kind of something that we're, we're doing, start starting to do actually being a, a dealer reseller for a lot of this gear as well. Um, so if you guys want to reach out, we are here to help. You can kind of plug into the church front team. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fun time. And check out Church Front Live. Um, anything you guys have else before we let people go? Nope. Worshipministryschool.com forward slash apply. Apply. See you soon. That wraps it up. Leave a like, share with your friends. We'll see you guys next time on the Church Front Show.